Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, so this is uh, one of the technovation talks uh, that we have at the United Nations, organized by the Office of Information and Communications Technology in cooperation with different partners from the UN system. And today we are having uh, Nicola Angels from the Future Blue Helmets. Um, and uh, he's gonna talk about Bitcoin, Ether, and cryptocurrencies. Um, we're gonna try to go very fast. We're gonna try to do a presentation in about 25 minutes to have plenty of time for questions and, and answers. So um, I'll leave it up to um, Nicola. Many thanks, Jorge, for introduction. So as you mentioned today, we'll talk about Bitcoin, Ether, and other cryptocurrency. Try to see what they are, uh, give you some economical insights, and I can show you how you can exchange money with them. So we will begin directly with Jorge by actually showing you a demo of an Ethereum transaction. So live, uh, Jorge will send me some money using Ethereum. So here you will see uh, Jorge's screen. And on this smaller screen, you are actually seeing mine. So, so that's 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 my screen right here. And uh, so this is a, a crypto wallet, um, which has multiple currencies: Bitcoin, Ether, Dash, and others. And we just picked uh, Ether because it resolves very quickly the transactions. So, um, and um, I'm going to send it to him, and he's going to show me yeah. the way to identify uh, him. Is that he's going to show me uh, his account number right there. That's a graphical representation of my account number, so that you can just take a photo to transfer funds. So Jorge will... So we're in the street and he says, me, please send me some money. So I come and look at his mobile phone, and uh, that code was transformed into this really long uh, string of numbers. Mm -hmm. And below that, I'm just gonna enter the amount that I'm gonna send. So I'm gonna send a very, very small amount of, of a cryptocurrency called Ether. 001 Ether are equivalent to uh, 30 cents, 30 US dollars, 30 cents of a dollar. So I put that his account number, an amount, and I'm gonna click now on send. So I'm gonna click now on send, um, um, to confirm the transaction. And uh, now we're gonna wait. There's gonna be a transaction now coming from me to him. And what's different about this is that this is sort of like an sending an email to China. I can just write to a person in China without any intermediaries, I can say anything I want. And so now I'm sending uh, a currency from me to him, he could be sitting anywhere in the world and we're not passing through a bank. That's, the, that's what's special about cryptocurrencies. And with that, um, let me see if, um, just gonna refresh my wallet. Uh, so the transaction is not yet registered. So it, at, at some moment it will appear here as a confirmed transaction. Yeah, that's still a known transaction we did before to test it, so we'll see another one coming probably in a few minutes. Right now it's on the network being validated, and so we should think coming live in a few minutes, hopefully. Okay. Yeah, one thing to appreciate is that these are uh, different wallets. <laughs> oh, pardon, transaction failed. Transaction failed, okay. <laughs> but one thing to appreciate here is that the, the wallets are different. So I'm sending from an independent uh, company that provides a, a wallet for cryptocurrencies, and he's receiving it in a different, mm -hmm. in a different uh, Type of wallet. And so with that, we'll go to the rest of the presentation. Yeah, so apparently this one failed. We'll try another one later. But hopefully, you understood the principle. Uh, so now let's uh, have a look at the economical landscape of cryptocurrencies. Oh, sorry, can you switch? So scroll back to my. Okay, a few facts and numbers about uh, cryptocurrency. So Bitcoin, which was the first modern cryptocurrency and actually the most used one, exists since 2009. <coughs> uh, since then, we have seen emergence of a huge number of cryptocurrency. The average number right now we consider is around 1,000 of them. <coughs> and uh, a few words about the Bitcoin network in itself. We'll see uh, how big it is. It's uh, 9,600 nodes across the world that are continuously connected to that, net to that network around the world. 477 million of addresses used. I took this number on Fridays. So probably you have a few more adding to that. And it's averaged almost 300,000 transactions per day on this Bitcoin network. So you have that number of transactions that happens every day. A small focus on the historical evolution of Bitcoin. So here you have 2009, when you see the value was almost at zero, until recently, 2016 where you have skyrocketing values that's now average 4,200-ish 
it's not enough, it's a very volatile currency. So we see a slow but steady evolution over the years, a sharp acceleration of the growth in the last years, which tell us that Bitcoin has been really used pretty recently, even if it existed before. And you may see a few bumps, which show us that there is a certain sensitivity of the currency to external factors. But to give, just to give a few, this drop here is probably due to a uh, decision of the Chinese government to limit uh, Bitcoin exchange on Chinese soil. And this in 2014 was at the time where the MTGOX exchange platform in Japan was hacked and then bankrupted. So you see those economic real events had a pretty strong impact on the curve. To recontextualize, a Bitcoin is not only the it's not the only cryptocurrency, there is, as I said, a thousand of them. Here I just play the top 10, uh, so you may recognize a few words. Bitcoin, of course, Ethereum, which is another well-known currency, and some of the Litecoin, or Dash, which are other kind of currency. So the interesting things to see is that the market capitalization of Bitcoin, again, those are Friday's number, was around 70 billion of US dollars, with a price around 4,000. Uh, and if you look at the rest of the top 10 currency, and if you add the number, you will see that Bitcoin by itself uh, weights almost one third of the market capitalization of all cryptocurrency. So it's definitely one of the biggest players out there. You can also see that with the volume, the volume, average volume exchange in 24 hours, and to give you an idea too, is 1.3 <coughs> billion of US dollar, which is fairly important, and it shows the currency is traded. Again, as you can see, Ethereum, the next well-known currency, uh, only half, yeah, not exactly a third, but uh, let's say 40% of um, the Bitcoin uh, volume of exchanges. The small graph is to remind you that a lot of its currency tend to be really volatile. We saw that with Bitcoin, if you remind, there is a lot of up and down. Those tend to be volatile currencies, and we'll come back to that later. So a few interesting characteristics of the Bitcoin in itself is that the absence of central authority, we'll see that it's based purely on a network, rather than immune to centralized manipulation schemes or even an impact by central bank, but not to speculation, which explains some of the volatility. The costs of transactions remain particularly low when you compare them to other remittance services, which average around 8% in the world. Uh, the transaction fees on the Bitcoin network are around 1%, between 0.5 and 1.5%, actually. It moves a lot. So even the fees are quite volatile, actually. So that's because there is no costly verification mechanisms that are usually attached to the traditional banking systems. Transactions are validated in a faster manner, 10 minutes for Bitcoin, even less for other networks, which is usually way faster than the traditional banking system. And finally, we'll see that in uh, the next part, that the structure in itself guarantees integrity, accountability, and accessibility of all the transaction data. So now we'll see the principle and functioning of the Bitcoin network. Uh, a lot of things we'll say can be applied to other cryptocurrencies, but as each cryptocurrency is a bit different, the general principle we apply, you may have some differences depending on the network. So we'll take Bitcoin as an example, actually. So as we said, they rely on a decentralized network of participants. There is no central financial establishments and anyone can become a member, create a wallet, an address, as we just did, to exchange on the network. They are secure exchange without the need of a central control authority. The settlement and the clearing mechanism are taken care of by the protocol behind the network. There is no third party external entity. And they can be pseudonymous or anonymous. For example, for the Bitcoin, it's what we call pseudonymous. Why? Because all the data of all transactions is public but you do not display your names, you display your Bitcoin address. We'll just see what Bitcoin address is. Think of it as your account number on the Bitcoin network. So to achieve that, so cryptocurrency use a specific term that we'll just review right now. Uh, all the participants of the networks, we mentioned the node, those are the participants of the network, they have a copy of the cryptocurrency ledger. This ledger that usually uses a blockchain uh, as all the history of all transactions made of the network, stored in a secure manner. We'll see after why. So you can really think as a record of all banking transactions that each node of the network has maintained and updates. Each participant can, but say, different Bitcoin addresses. Again, those Bitcoin addresses are like bank account number. You can send money and receive money from them. This is, for example, a first generation Bitcoin address. 
So you see it's really a long suite of characters. And finally, as I already mentioned, those addresses are not tied to identities. So you don't have to actually give your identities your name or your social security number, but you have to possess a private key. And this private key, which is attached to this address, will be, will be how you prove that you actually possess a file. We'll see how it works just after that. Finally, last important notion after ledgers and addresses is the blockchain. What is a blockchain? Basically, is a chain of blocks, each of the blocks containing data. So basically, you put the transaction in a block, you validate the block, and attach it to the rest of the chain. They have interesting property. First of all, they are tamper-proof, which means if I want to go in the past to modify one of the record, one of the data, there is a mechanism that will invalidate the rest of the chain and show that someone tried to tamper with it. Second, as we mentioned, they can be used in decentralized network. So you abandon the classical star model with a lot of clients connecting to one central entity, but you have a fully decentralized network. And finally, it can be trusted without a central authority. You have mechanism, consensus mechanism on it, that ensure the integrity of the data without the need of a third party. Let's try to apply that and try to understand what actually happened when we transferred the Bitcoin earlier, I mean, when we tried to transfer the Bitcoin earlier. We did that with Ethereum, but the principle behind it will be the same. So first of all, I have an initial situation, sender, Jorge, wants to transfer me, let's say, 10 Bitcoin. Of course, 10 Bitcoin will be like $40,000, so it will be a way smaller amount. Let's say Jorge, which is a sender, already has 100 Bitcoin, at which is stored in his address. That's the part of the Bitcoin address. He wants to send me some money to the receiver's address. We get the second Bitcoin addresses. So your transaction will be address of the sender, Jorge, wants to send 10 Bitcoin to my addresses. What is actually happening behind the scene is that Jorge's phone sent the detail of the transaction, so the address sending, the address receiving, the amount, and a small fee. We'll see why there is a small fee attached to it. He signed it using the private key we talked about, which is attached to the address, and he sent this transaction plus the signatures to the whole network. The networks receive these transactions and spread it around the networks. At some point, you will have special entities, which you call the miners, this is why you may have heard of mining processes, which is basically a validator. It will pick up the transaction in the network, so not only the transaction we did, but also other transactions. It checks two things. First, that the signature is valid, so that you actually possess the phone because you have the private key. Second, it checks that the transaction itself is valid. If Jorge didn't have enough money to send me money, the network would have detected and say, mm -mm, he cannot send 10 Bitcoin, he doesn't have, he doesn't have them. Once he made this verification, he had the transaction to a block. Once he had enough transaction in a block, he do a cryptographic process, which basically means solving a difficult puzzle, and he finds a solution. So now what he has is a block with all the transaction and a solution. This block gets broadcasted to the network, and each node of the networks checks two things. First, that the transaction within a block, I don't know why they did that, you know the, ah. So first, you check that the transaction within the block are valid. And second, you check that the solution found by the validator is valid too. So each node of the network has basically two choices. Sorry. First, to deem the block valid, because the transaction plus the block solution are valid. So this block is valid. He adds it to this local copy of the blockchain. Or it's not valid. Then he will not accept it, reject it, and wait for another valid block. So after a few minutes, that's why we need to wait, a valid block will propagate itself across the blockchain, and everyone will have a new block with new transaction. And among this set of transactions, you will see that Jorge, the sender, sent 10 bitcoins plus the fees, which will go to the miner, that's why we have a fee, because the person that is validating the transaction needs to be rewarded for that, so you're paying a small fee, to the receiver. Each participant has updated the, net, the record in his own version of the blockchain, and now the network has a new state, and now that Jorge doesn't have 100 Bitcoin anymore, he only has 90, and I got 10 Bitcoin more. <laughs> so we gave a few each account, the sending address and the receiving address are two different things, right? When yeah. Sending, it's one, or is it generated every time you send something? 
you're sending it from an address to another, and you can either choose to use the same set of address each time, but it's recommended by the protocol to actually use a new address every time. So it's like you process multiple bank accounts, if you would to put it that way. So the question we can ask ourselves is, can we consider cryptocurrency as a money, as a real money? Let's recall the characteristic of the money. It has to be a medium of exchange, so it has to allow you to exchange a value. It has to be a measure of value, so it must allow you to give the price of something. And it has to be a store of value. So if I possess 100 Bitcoin today, I would want in one month to still have my 100 Bitcoins more or less the same value, if you forget the phenomenon of inflation, for example. And a few specific characteristics that make them more convenient. Durable, portable, divisible, so that you can pay small amounts, fungible or uniform, which means you cannot differentiate sorry, between two units, for example, a $20 bill and a $20 bill are the same, you cannot really distinguish yourself. Limited supply, so what is called scarcity, because you don't want to have an unlimited amount of money or it has no value anymore. Acceptability in a sufficient network so that you can actually pay with it. And difficulty to counterfeit it, because if you can counterfeit it, you defeat the purpose of money. We see that a fiat currency like dollar, euro, or whatever good currency uh, that the government uses, they respect all those things. With a Bitcoin, we have a few challenges uh, attached to that. Is it a medium of exchange? Yes, it is, because I will just prove I can send money with it. We can exchange a value. But it may not be a perfect measure of value. The reason, no, sorry. The reason why is I mentioned, and we saw in the first slide, that Bitcoin is highly volatile. So if right now I am possessing one Bitcoin, which is $4,000, Maybe today it will be at three point five thousand dollar. So I may have lost a lot of value. And the same for the store of value. I cannot really say that Bitcoin store my value because I don't know the which will be the exchange rate tomorrow. Hence I'm gonna guarantee that I haven't lose actual money. For the rest of the characteristics, it's definitely durable because in the end, as you see, it's just an address and a private key which you can write on paper, which you can have on a computer. Portable, yes, for the same reason. Divisible, actually yes, because you can divide a Bitcoin into satoshis, which is hundreds of million of a Bitcoin. Is that fungible? Well, that may be problematic, and a nice example is you may have heard of the WannaCry attack, which was a ransomware attack that happened a few months ago. Actually, the people behind this attack, they asked people to pay ransom, using a Bitcoin address, actually three of them. So everyone was looking at those three Bitcoin address, and when the phone were withdrawn, everyone could follow where the money was actually going, because remember, Bitcoin is public. So it may be difficult because the next person wanted to use the Bitcoin attached to a cybercrime. Cybercrime on any malleable of intent may not be able to, because someone will say, hey, maybe there is something fishy behind it. Acceptability finally is another problem, because even if Bitcoin is entering the real economy, it's still difficult to actually pay in Bitcoin everywhere. You can do that on a few websites. It's really more rare in the real economy. And difficult to come to fate, yes, because the cryptographic uh, systems that are behind Bitcoin are actually pretty difficult to bypass. So Bitcoin as a money, it's a challenge because mainly due to its high volatility, its limited acceptability, and the disposable fungibility. The real problem behind that, if we think those in the term, is that there is actually an economy around Bitcoin. So you will find Bitcoin exchanges that will translate fiat currencies, dollar, euro, to Bitcoin. You have people providing wallets that make some money out of it. You have initial coin offering, which are like initial public offering done on the traditional markets, but on virtual networks. So you have definitely an economy around the Bitcoin but there is an absence of an economy purely based on Bitcoin. So in the end, all this activity is still tied to the dollar economy, to the euro economy, or to the currency economy, which kind of explain what of the priority of Bitcoin, because there is no real underlying economy purely based on Bitcoin, it tends to be volatile, sensitive to uh, external market factors, and which actually let us ask the questions the legal and regulatory status of Bitcoin is not clear due to this old property. 
There is no worldwide consensus of how you should define it. Some countries say Bitcoin and derivatives is forbidden. Some others say it's a property. Others say it should be a commodity, a security, or an asset. And finally, one country, Japan actually, is recognizing Bitcoin as a legal tender. Generally speaking, the high monetary risk associated with this money, or not real money, this virtual currency, cryptocurrency, that is highly volatile, which can be difficult to track because remember that we talked about pseudonymity. You don't have the actual identity, you have addresses that you can follow. And so behind that, actually identify the person behind, so the individual actually makes the exchange. That makes it difficult for government to consider it as a true legal tender. And we additionally can re mention the speculation that happened on Bitcoin. So, huge impact you have. We gave two examples at the beginning a Chinese uh, market uh, exchange prohibition or the empty uh, GRX example. And finally, is the fact that there is no regulation that is easily achievable because we said there is no need for a third party settlement entity, there is no need to an external validation, which also means it's really difficult to regulate. Finally, and to conclude, uh, we can open to this new phenomenon you may have heard of, which are smart contract and actually ICO, the virtual currency-based IPOs. Uh, those ICOs see the actual level since the beginning of the year that are a bit higher than the earlier stage venture capital done by internet companies, which means some startups, they actually raised more money through these new ICOs on virtual, net on virtual currency networks than uh, the traditional financing system. The second things are the smart contract. They leverage just distributed ledger technology. A blockchain is a form of distributed, distributed ledger technology to achieve more complete operation. That's what the Ethereum network actually is built for. It's not only a cryptocurrency you can exchange, you can do way more powerful things with them. And so this recent phenomenon, they could lead to emergence of an actual virtual currency based economy which if you have an actual real economy with uh, real cash flows behind the Bitcoin or Ethereum or any other cryptocurrency, it may help establish a certain stability and create some form of macroeconomic phenomenon only at the Bitcoin level, not necessarily dependent from the Euro, the dollar on any other uh, markets. And that could be uh, in the future, we'll see next six months, 12 months, I don't know exactly, uh, we could see actually Bitcoin becoming more stable, Ethereum becoming more stable, and actually create a real ecosystem, a real economy uh, behind those cryptocurrency. And I believe that will be the talk of another uh, technovation more centered on those smart contract issues and ICO everything can do with it actually. I thank you for your uh, attention. Now we will have a Q&A remarks, feel free to participate for the rest of the session. So thanks a lot for your attention and uh, well, feel free to ask questions.